Hi everyone, I'm Madsen Goudreau-Simard. And I'm Zain Burhani. Today we're going to talk about diastology at the point of care, and we'd like to thank Dr. Rob Arnfield for his help with this project. So the purpose of our talk today is not to do a deep dive into diastolic dysfunction as interpreted by a cardiologist, but rather to focus on what we think is the most useful clinical parameter of diastolic assessment, which is left atrial pressure. So our objectives for today is first to go through why is diastology important clinically, and that goes to estimating left atrial pressure, how to assess left atrial pressure using diastology. So we're going to take you through how to obtain the measurements at the point of care and how to interpret the measurements. And finally, we'll go through some cases that illustrate how useful left atrial pressure can be clinically. So before we talk about left atrial pressure, we need to briefly mention lung ultrasound and pleural line. As you may recall, alveolar interstitial syndrome is defined by the presence of diffuse bilateral B-lines as depicted on this clip. The next question at this point is usually if this represents cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The only thing on lung ultrasound, unfortunately, that helps you distinguish the primary etiology of bilateral B-lines is the pleural line. Now, in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the pleural line is usually smooth and regular, whereas in a diffuse infectious or inflammatory process, the pleural line is often thick and irregular. What makes this challenging, however, is that there's no standardized approach to the, to the assessment of the pleural thickness, and this is often subjective with poor interoperator reliability and a fair amount of diagnostic uncertainty. So we found that LEP can be a useful tool in providing some clarity as to the etiology of B-lines. LEP is also known as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, and left ventricular end diastolic pressure. What's important to understand is that an elevation in left atrial pressure is a substrate for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And so very simply, in the presence of bilateral B-lines, a high left atrial pressure favors cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and a normal or low left atrial pressure favors an infectious or inflammatory process. So we'll go through some cases that we're going to solve at the end of our presentation with the use of left atrial pressure. So the first case is a 64-year-old woman with a history of poorly controlled hypertension and possible COPD that was admitted to the ICU with hypoxemic respiratory failure. So this is her thoracic scan, so she had anterior B lines bilaterally. And so the question was, is this cardiogenic pulmonary edema or is it viral pneumonia? Case number two is of a 53-year-old female post-op laparotomy for bowel perforation with ongoing hypoxia and a chest x-ray showing diffuse parenchymal disease. So we start with her lung scan. We see that she's got diffuse B-lines bilaterally. And the clinical question is, is this ARDS or is this cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Now we'll come back to these cases and hopefully convince you how left atrial pressure can be helpful in solving these problems. Let's talk a little bit about diastole. Now, this is a dense slide, but it's an important one, so I want you to stay with me because it'll provide you with the framework for understanding diastology. We have a depiction here of the changes in LV volume and velocity across the mitral valve during diastole. As you may recall, diastole begins with the opening of the mitral valve. In early diastole, we have a rapid filling phase allowing for passive blood flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Given that volumes are not easily quantified on POCUS, we use velocities across structures such as valves to assess cardiac function. The early phase of diastole, or the passive filling phase, is manifested as the E wave as seen here. In the second phase, called diastasis, there is no flow across the mitral valve as the pressure between the left atrium and the left ventricle equalizes. And since there is no flow, there is no velocity across the valve. Finally, in the third or late phase of diastole, the atrial kick accounts for more LV filling, depicted here as the A wave. Together, the E and the A wave make up what we call the mitral valve inflow pattern, and this forms the basis of diastology assessment at the point of care. Now, in order to obtain the mitral valve inflow, we use a form of spectral Doppler called pulse wave Doppler to interrogate the flow across the mitral valve. Now, we'll show you how to actually do this later on in our presentation, but this is the tracing you would obtain. There are a few important points I want to make here. The first is that the E and the A waves, as labeled, are always positive deflections seen above the baseline as blood is moving towards the probe in diastole. Now, it can sometimes be tricky to identify the E and the A wave, so there are a few things you can do to help you identify them. First, 
Identify the systolic flow away from the ultrasound probe, depicted here as a negative deflection, which represents blood leaving the LV cavity, moving away from your probe during systole, and that would be a deflection below the baseline. The first positive deflection after this negative deflection is usually your E wave. Alternatively, you could also use ECG leads to help you identify the phases of systole and diastole. For a refresher on the principles of Doppler, please refer to Western Sono. We also use tissue Doppler imaging, which is a type of spectral Doppler, to interrogate the movement of the myocardium at the level of the mitral valve. Diastolic dysfunction results from impaired LV relaxation. Therefore, myocardial movement is impaired in patients with diastolic dysfunction, and this can be quantified using tissue Doppler imaging at the mitral valve annulus. So this is the tracing that you would obtain. So let's go through the different waves here. First is the S wave, which is a positive deflection above the baseline as the myocardium contracts and moves towards the apex and towards your ultrasound probe in systole. Right after the S wave is the E prime, which is of interest to us. This represents movement of the myocardium away from our ultrasound probe as the myocardium relaxes in early diastole. We then have the A prime wave, which represents further relaxation in late diastole with the atrial kick. So now that we've established E and E prime, let's look at their relationship as it pertains to left atrial pressure. On the top here, you have mitral valve inflow, so E velocity. And on the bottom, you have tissue Doppler imaging of the mitral valve annulus, and that's your E prime. As you move from left to right, this illustrates how E and E prime velocity change as left atrial pressure increases. As your left atrial pressure worsens, your E velocity increases as the pressure in your LA increases, leading to faster flow of blood across the mitral valve in early diastole. Inversely, as your left atrial pressure worsens, the movement of the myocardium at the mitral valve annulus decreases and E prime gets smaller. Therefore, as your left atrial pressure rises, the ratio of E over E prime dramatically increases. Okay, so let's talk about some numbers that are important to remember. If your E over E prime is less than 8, then you have a normal left atrial pressure. If your E over E prime is greater than 14, then you have an elevated left atrial pressure. If your E over E prime is between 8 to 14, then it's tricky to determine if the left atrial pressure is elevated or not. In our experience, this range can be used as a spectrum, where a value closer to 8 is suggestive of a lower left atrial pressure, and a value closer to 14 is suggestive of a higher left atrial pressure. To be clear though, the E over E prime does not equate to your left atrial pressure. For the POCUS nerds out there, the NAGWA formula actually allows you to calculate an LAP from the E over E prime ratio. Simplified, your LAP is equal to E over E prime plus 4. In any event, the E over E prime cutoffs that are identified here are the important numbers we want you to remember. Now, for whatever reason you cannot accurately perform tissue Doppler to obtain an E prime velocity, fear not, because the E over A ratio can give you some insight into the LAP as well. So if you recall, as Mathilde mentioned, as your LAP increases, the E velocity also increases. Therefore, a low E to A ratio, particularly one that's less than 0.8, is usually suggestive or indicative of a, of a normal left atrial pressure. And a high E to A ratio, particularly one over two, is usually indicative of an elevated left atrial pressure. So now that we've convinced you of the usefulness of left, left atrial pressure clinically, let's go through how to obtain the measurements at the point of care. So first we'll go through pulse wave Doppler of mitral valve inflow. So your first step is to make sure that you have an apical four chamber view. You wanna make sure that your septum is perpendicular to your ultrasound probe, and you want to make sure that your LV cavity is well centered on your screen. Once you've optimized your image, you choose PW, so pulse wave, which will then drop your sampling volume, which you will then place between your mitral valve leaflets as they open in diastole. You press PW again, and you obtain this tracing, which you'll recognize. So this shows your E and your A wave. Using the caliber tool on your machine, you can measure the velocity of your E wave and the velocity of your A wave. Most machines will have a preset that allows you to see your E to A ratio right on your machine. 
The next step is tissue Doppler imaging, and here we'll show the medial mitral valve annulus. So again, you have to obtain an apical four chamber view, not an apical five chamber view. And you want to select your pulse wave tissue Doppler, so not simply pulse wave, not continuous wave, but pulse wave TDI, which you then place on the medial mitral valve annulus. If you press PWTDI again, you'll obtain this tracing that you'll recognize. So you can move up the baseline to center the tracing on your screen, and you'll recognize your S wave, your E prime, and your A prime. So again, using the Calibro tool on your machine, you can measure the velocity of your E prime. You would obtain the same measurement on the lateral mitral valve annulus. So the reason that we use both is that if we're able to obtain both tracings, we would average the E prime for our E over E prime ratio. So now we're going to go back to our cases and use what we've learned to solve our clinical questions. So as you'll recall, case one was a 64-year-old woman with poorly controlled hypertension, possible COPD, admitted with hypoxic respiratory failure, and the question was whether she, was in, she had cardiogenic pulmonary edema or a viral pneumonia. So you'll remember her thoracic scan showed anterior B lines. Pulse wave Doppler of mitral valve inflow shows an E of 81 centimeters per second. Tissue Doppler imaging on the medial side shows an E prime of 5.81. The lateral E prime was 5.81 as well, and so the E over E prime was 14. So this is elevated left atrial pressure, and this patient was diagnosed with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and she was diuresed. So going back to case number two of a 53-year-old female post-op laparotomy with ongoing hypoxia and a chest x-ray showing diffuse parenchymal opacities. So once again, our thoracic scan is showing diffuse B lines anteriorly. We do pulse wave Doppler uh, to interrogate mitral valve inflow, and we see here she's got an E velocity of 77 centimeters per second. We then move on to medial tissue Doppler imaging, uh, and we find an E prime velocity in the medial side of 11.6 centimeters per second, and an E over E prime in the medial of 6.6. .6. And we do the same on the lateral, and we get an E over E prime of 5.8. If you average those two out, you actually get an E over E prime that's less than 8, and therefore uh, the B lines that we're seeing on the lung scan secondary to an infectious or inflammatory process and possible ARDS and unlikely cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So we do want to mention some limitations of this technique. So the first one is atrial fibrillation, in which you have variable diastolic filling time and therefore variable E velocity and E prime velocity. A uh, poor Doppler signal is an important one because you can under or overestimate your both your E and your E prime. Mitral disease, so mitral valve annular calcifications or mitral regurgitation are both contraindications to this technique. Conduction abnormalities, basal segmental wall motion abnormalities, and tachycardia where you often get fusion of your E and A waves. Okay, so let's go over some take-home points. We hope by now we've convinced you that left atrial pressure can be useful in difficult cases when trying to distinguish the primary etiology of B-lines, especially when the pleural line thickness is difficult to interpret. LAP is derived from E over E prime, and it's particularly helpful at its extremes. So if you have an E over E prime less than 8, you have a normal left atrial pressure, and if you have an E over E prime greater than 14, you have an elevated left atrial pressure. Well, thank you very much for listening. We hope you found this helpful. Happy scanning.